this short introduction to the Baroque bow, I'm going to take you through the difference between this bow, a copy of an actual bow made in 1591, to the bow that I most often play in the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, which is this Baroque bow. They're both very different from the modern bow, but in fact, there is, of course, a big difference between these two. This is a very unusual bow because it's copied from a real example of a bow, which is very rare from the 16th century, rather than bows that are just copied from paintings. It's made of larch wood, it's beautifully decorated with gilt, and we know that it belonged to a violin in the Tyrol and has remained catalogued ever since then. It's very curious to play, it's particularly light, um, and I was playing a, that piece of dance music from Pretorius then in the manner of the French and German hold of the early Baroque. In other words, with my thumb on the hair, on the frog, um, which could to some extent control the tension of the hair. Because at this point in the history of the bow, there is no screw to alter the tension of the hair by moving the frog. So the great differences in bows during the Baroque period, this is roughly from 1600 or so to 1750, is the length of the bow, the materials with which the bow was made, the number of hairs, the mechanism for tightening the hair, if there was one, and the sort of decoration on the stick. This bow is made from larch wood, but later on in the Baroque period, a lot of bows were made from tropical hardwoods, such as snake wood and then Pernambuco. So that's a change in the technology during the time of the Baroque, which matched very much the changing nature of the music that was being written for these bows. In 1636, the writer Mazen comments on the violin bow. The said wooden part is usually called the stick or the brin and the threads, the hair, because it is made of 80 or 100 strands of horse hair, although it could be taken from the hair of many other animals, or even a slip of wood as desired, since if it is rubbed with resin, it will make the strings sound. was from Monteverdi's Vespers of 1610, a really famous piece of Baroque music. And that was the beginning of the first violin part. And I was playing that with my second example of a Baroque bow today. You can immediately see that it's made of a much darker wood, a much denser wood. This is snake wood with a lovely, beautifully pointed sort of swan-like head. There's still not very much hair on the bow. And the frog is this piece of wood here that separates the stick from the hair. In a modern bow, there's very different sort of technology here. The frog is still fixed. I can take it in and out altogether, but I can't alter the tension of the hair. And luckily, it went back. In 1620, Francesco Rognani writes, the viola de braccio, especially the violin, is an instrument that is naturally raw and harsh, unless tempered and sweetened by gentle bowing. Let this be a lesson to those who make a rough sound through not using the full length of the bow on the instrument and take it off the string with such force that the bow makes more noise than the music. from Bieber's Battaglia and a representation of Mars, the god of war. And for that extract, I was using a bow that looks very similar to the previous one. It's about 10 centimetres longer and it's appropriate for music at around 1670, particularly in Salzburg where Bieber was working. So I call it my Bieber bow. Now you can probably see this 
strange little bit of leather at the bottom and I had to put that in this morning because the hair was very loose and the only way that I can tighten the hair to give me more tension to be able to play is by having either a bit of leather or cardboard or paper between the hair and the frog to give it a little bit more tension and in fact there's a wonderful painting of a baroque bow actually with an ivory nut at the top indeed with a little bit of paper that just enables the player to play with a bit more tension. One thing that's very interesting about playing some of these early bows particularly the 17th century bows is that unlike the high baroque bows of the 18th century they actually work really well for the very fast diminutions and articulation and fast passage work that's so characteristic of this very idiomatic writing for the violin at the time and I think you can hear that in the writing violin writing of Monteverdi and of Bieber so these are really tools that do the musical job that they were intended for. short phrase of music was from a sonata by Corelli who was one of the most famous violinists at the beginning of the 18th century and he often uh, ornamented the music that he wrote so in fact what I played wasn't exactly what was on the page but that's the subject of another video. So this bow is slightly longer, slightly more hair um, and it starts to have a very tiny bit of decorated um, carving on the stick itself but that doesn't really alter the sound and there's an amusing anecdote about Corelli that I'd like to share with you. The writer about music Robert Bremner in 1777 claimed that he had a report from one of Corelli's pupils. I have been informed that Corelli judged no performer fit to play in his band who could not, with one stroke of his bow, give a steady and powerful sound like that of an organ from two strings at once and continue it for ten seconds. And yet, it is said, the length of their bows at that time did not exceed twenty inches. Well, that's actually quite hard to do. <laughs> There were, of course, differences um, between bows made in France, Germany, Italy and England, but we have so few examples left from the time that often we all, all we have to go on are paintings um, to find out the relative lengths of the bow, the amount of hair and the type of decoration. But one thing that was for sure and goes right across all countries in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries was that the bow was the soul of the violin. In 1761, Labéfice wrote in his Principles du Violon, one can call the bow the soul of the instrument which it touches, because it serves to give the expression to the tones, to spin them out, to swell them and to diminish them. That was a very surprising opening of one of my very favourite Handel violin sonatas, just the first couple of bars. And to play that, I was using a bow that actually does look quite different. This is a copy of a bow from about 1740, and I hope you can see the extraordinary amount of decoration on the stick, right up to the point. This is called fluting. It's very difficult to do, so this shows you that this is a bow that was really exceptionally well crafted. It's a high value bow, as it were, um, including what looks like a nut, but in fact, that's not a screw. This is still a fixed frog bow. And we know that fluting started to be added to bows in about the 1730s or so. And at the same time, 
some screws which could move the frog and therefore alter the tension on the hair were also introduced then, but it wasn't commonplace like it is now for bows. Now we come to the final Baroque bow that I brought with me today and I've just played a tiny extract of a obbligato from Bach's Christmas Oratorio that's a duet, beautiful duet, with an alto singer and I was playing that on what I think is a sort of reimagination of a Baroque bow that I'd like, I'd like to call that. It's not necessarily a copy of anything. All the bows that I was playing today were copies, they weren't originals. Um, and this bow was made for me by a very interesting bow maker who actually made it to the specifications of my playing as he saw it. And that might actually have been the sort of relationship that many violinists might have had with bow makers in the past. Um, it has a little bit of a grip. The thick stick is so fine. I um, have a tiny bit of leather um, over the stick near where, near where I hold it. Um, you've probably noticed that Apart from the very early bow held down here, actually my fingers are slightly higher up the bow than they might be with a modern one. This does have a screw mechanism, but it's incredibly clever because rather than moving the frog along the bow, which can very slightly alter the point of balance of the bow, actually this um, screw mechanism moves the hair itself inside to create the tension. It's a very clever bow altogether. It's not always the easiest bow to play but I learn a lot from it every day.